Now we'll talk about nutrition and childhood, which again, similar to the previous lecture, should be a review of life cycle nutrition. So weight typically increases two to three kilograms per year until children are nine or 10 years of age. Then the rate increases, indicating the approach of puberty, and height increases approximately six to eight centimeters per year from age two and a half until puberty. Now, while we, that makes it sound very nice and linear at six to eight centimeters a year, growth can be erratic and occur in spurts. So you'll see very steep lines on the growth chart and then it may level off and then it may be very steep or it may just be continuous growth. Now fat composition gradually decreases during early childhood years. So again, what we noted is going back to infancy is that at the first nine months, children might become kind of these big roly polies and they should be have a higher body fat percentage. And then again, what we should see is then they kind of lean out throughout childhood. We then have what's known as adiposity rebound, where we have an increase in body fatness in preparation for the pubertal growth spurt. And so earlier adiposity rebound is associated with increased BMI later in life. So we have the roly poly, the child leans out. If they then gain weight earlier, they're increased risk for having higher BMI later. So we do have the CDC growth charts for two to 20 years of age to evaluate height, weight, and BMI. So yes, right, pediatric conditions are considered up until 20 years of age because again, while the law may be arbitrary at 18, and we're looking at physiological development, again, we're looking up until 20. So again, one-time snapshots do not allow for interpretation of a growth pattern, so we need multiple points on the chart. And regular monitoring of growth enables problematic trends to be identified early and interventions initiated. And so ideally, right, the physician will refer a patient to the dietitian if there's growth intake, if there's growth issues, nutrient intake, calorie intake, etc. Now to assess body composition, we can use mid-arm circumference and tricep skin fold. So here you can see an example of a growth chart that's been plotted. So again, this is for a boy. And so you can again see, so sometimes the line is steeper, sometimes it's flat, sometimes it's very steep. And again, we know that some of those spurts, right, are common and completely normal. And so here we can see another patient, so this time a female patient. Now the only thing that does seem a little unusual is the fact that the weight had such a dramatic drop. But again, this could be a change in um, recording. So I know for one, at one point, my child's growth chart actually showed a decrease in height, which is obviously not possible. So again, we wanna make sure that we're getting accurate measurements. So we've seen these charts previously looking at the rate of growth. Now again, instead of seeing them from one to two, we've now seen them from three to 20, and you can see there's a significant decrease. So for example, the mean rate of weight gain for boys at three to four is 1.9 kilos per year. And remember that as a newborn baby, it was 935, kilo, 935 grams or almost one kilo a month. So you can see, right, this is in essence almost 10 times slower when compared to an infant. So we do have the DRI from the Institutes of Medicine. So this is inside every textbook you'll ever use. So again, children are constantly growing and developing and waking as necessary. And so they do need the more nutritious food in proportion to their size than do adults. So we're not growing up, adults only grow outwards. Children are growing both up and outwards. And so they actually need higher quality and better and more nutritious food than adults do. When we look at macronutrient distribution, so for one to three year olds, we want 45 to 65% of our calories as carbs, 30 to 40% as fat, and five to 20% as protein. And then at four to 18 years of age, we instead see right this decrease in fat intake of 25 to 35% and an increase of 10 to 30% of our diet from protein. So again, we know that infants and children need higher amounts of fat to support their growth. But again, at four years of age, right, we actually decrease the fat intake in the diet. Here again is the previous chart. So instead, we're no longer focused on the infant's portion. We're now focused on the children's portion. And again, here's the equation for estimated energy requirements. And so again, we're looking at so young children. And again, you can see the equation with the different adjustment factors. 
Again, a nice summary. Here we have the Schofield equation, which is a slightly different equation. And so again, this one does have stress factors. I would encourage you, if you want to just see the difference, take an example and use the equation for the same person and just see how similar the numbers are. Here again, we have the World Health Organization equations, but instead of focusing on zero to three, you'll notice the three to 10 and 10 to 18. Her protein needs decrease slightly from early childhood to late adulthood. And so again, we're looking at that grams per kilogram. You'll actually, of course, be eating more protein because the child's increasing in size. Now deficiencies though are very rare for protein in the US as there's a cultural emphasis on high protein foods. Even when you think of, for example, the average Happy Meal, right, which contains a protein containing burger, chicken nuggets from Chick-fil-A, uh, you're looking at Taco Bell, so you're looking at, again, high protein if they want tacos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but protein is a very large focus of American dishes. So less than 3% of children fail to meet the RDA in the U.S. The children that are at risk for protein deficiency are going to be those following strict vegan diets, those with food allergies, as again, we're actually allergic to the protein molecules, or a limited selection of food due to fad diets, behavioral problems, or inadequate access. For vitamins and minerals, increased risk for iron deficiency anemia from one to three years of age due to rapid growth rate. So again, we actually need that iron, especially for blood cells and grow. Calcium is needed for adequate mineralization and maintenance of growing bone in children. Zinc deficiency results in growth failure, poor appetite, decreased taste acuity, and poor wound healing. And vitamin D is needed for calcium absorption and the deposition of calcium in the bones. So again, calcium, or especially in the form of dairy, is not necessary, right? So humans do not have to have dairy for survival, but is a very convenient, very high quality and concentrated source of calcium, and it is fortified with vitamin D. So looking at supplements, so approximately 40% of preschool children are given a multivitamin with mineral supplement. Um, and so who actually is giving their kids vitamins, right? Now, who, who grew up with Flintstones? So families with more education, health insurance coverage, and higher incomes have higher rates of supplement use. So also the people that can afford the better quality food and don't have the food insecurity. So the people that are getting the vitamins aren't necessarily the people that need the vitamins. So supplements though often don't contain much calcium. So again, the Flintstones, especially because of their size, are, do, not very, do not typically contain very large quantities of calcium. So again, we're still gonna need to either um, encourage that in the diet, so with things like dairy products or other sources. Fluoride supplement may be recommended for children six months to 16 years of age if community water is not fluoridated. Um, again, though, unless you're on well water, uh, I believe almost all mun municipal water in the United States is fluoridated. The American Academy of Pediatrics does not recommend giving healthy children routine supplements. However, children at risk for malnutrition may benefit. So these are patients with poor appetite, poor intakes, um, on fad diets, and this can be, again, caused by the family. If they have a history of chronic disease, deprived families or children of abuse or neglect, children on diet programs to manage severe obesity, uh, children that are either allergic or choose not to consume dairy products, and if there's an observed case of failure to thrive. So again, I think we all kind of grew up with or are familiar with the infamous Flintstones. I think it's funny, it's still the vitamin, even though children these days have literally never seen these cartoons. Maybe we'll talk about catch-up growth, and I'll review this during the Zoom session as well. So it involves a rapid increase in weight, length, and head circumference, and continues until the normal individual growth pattern is resumed. So this is commonly done with premature infants and infants with failure to thrive, or a child recovering from an illness or undernutrition, has experienced slowed growth or ceased growth, we're going to give them extra nutrients and calories and protein to help them catch up and reach where they quote unquote should be. So our goals for catch up growth are going to be improved energy intake, promoting weight gain, allowing optimal growth and correcting any nutritional deficiencies. Once the child catches up in weight, then dietary management goes back to being focused on 
slowing the rate of weight gain so that they just stay on the normal curve and don't continue to accelerate beyond normal. So what you're going to do is plot the child's height and weight on the growth chart, determine the child's recommended calories and protein for age based on the RDA, and determine the ideal weight at the 50th percentile for the child's height, multiply the RDA calories by, or protein by ideal body weight for height, and then divide this by the child's actual weight. Now that sounds horribly complicated. And so while that description sounds really complicated, when we look at it, it makes sense. So you just have to realize that for ketchup growth, people need more calories. So what you would do is you look at the number and you take the calories for their age, multiply them by their ideal weight for height, and divide it by their actual weight. And so what you'll see is then the calorie numbers will go up. If the number doesn't go up, you know you've set the problem up incorrectly. So we'll do this example and we'll review this during the Zoom session, but you can actually plot this. So if you want to print this out or if you want to do it on your computer with a ruler. So in essence, a normal child would be getting 108 calories per kilogram, but because they're behind and they're so low on the growth chart, we're going to increase their calories to 144. And so we will review this math during the Zoom session. So providing an adequate diet, so more food is consumed in environments outside of the home. So you'll notice now that, uh, you know, we kind of are probably the last of that generation that grew up, you know, eating two to three meals at home per day. Now there's very many meals that are consumed in cars on the way to school, in cars after school on the way to activities. And then we're lucky if dinner is consumed in the home or again, it might even be consumed again in the car on the way home from said activities for children. Foods with low nutrient density often displace nutrient-dense foods. So again, when children are eating potato chips, they're not eating low-fat dairy. They're not eating whole grains. They're not eating fruits and vegetables. So factors that influence food intake is going to be family environment, societal trends, media messages, and then most famously is peer influence. So my child absolutely refused to eat cheese until his best friend at school one day had a cheese stick, and now he is utterly obsessed with cheese sticks. I have to buy them two to three packs at a time because he just devours cheese sticks. No matter how much and how delicious I promised him they were, it wasn't until a friend of his, he saw them and wanted to steal one from their lunchbox, that now he thinks they're the greatest thing ever. Now again, we can see, and so again, there's an emphasis on food is more than just the macronutrients it contains, right? We are not just kept alive by nutrient broth with calories, protein, micronutrients, right? There's something that goes into preparing food, right? Having a role in the family, working as a team, right? And then consuming the food, right? There's more to food than just the stuff in it. And so again, we want to still encourage this, right? So we're not just mindlessly eating, uh, buying food outside the house, etc. So feeding preschool age children. So we'll talk, for example, about the development of food jags. So this is periods when foods that were previously liked are refused, or there were repeated requests to eat the same food meal after meal. Um, and so this is part of development and is, is normal, which is very, very frustrating. But this is where like, for example, kids are obsessed with macaroni and cheese and they want it every single meal. That's all they want. But then after two weeks, they don't want that and macaroni is disgusting. And they only want dino nuggets over and over and over again. So it's very frustrating, but this is very normal. Um, but again, we just wanna respond the best we can. So again, if we can get them to eat other foods, but again, we still need to get them to eat. So better that they eat than not eat. So we wanna offer preschool aged children small servings frequently at four to six times a day. And so we say snacks are as important as meals because it's not really true meals so much as snacks and meals basically are just mini sized meals for these types of patients. We want to avoid excessive juice intake. Again, this can result in diarrhea and may decrease appetite. And high intakes of high fructose corn syrup may lead to increased triglycerides and insulin resistance, even in young children. And we, of course, want to limit and avoid processed foods and high sugar beverages. And so I don't know if any of you ever grew up eating at the infamous kids table, um, but again, 
as stated previously, right, is that actually observing their peers eating food. So one, eating with their peers increases intake. And then two, when they see their peers consuming a specific food, they may be more apt to try a new food, right, or selecting a new or different food. Like I said, my child would consume yogurt, but he absolutely refused to eat cheese until he saw a classmate eating string cheese. And now it's absolutely the most like important thing of the day. So for school-aged children, we have a constant increase in food intake from six to 12 years of age. So they're gonna get larger and eat more food. And so to help with this, so we do have the National School Lunch Program that's run by the USDA. So the levels of fat and sodium remain relatively high while the levels of fiber remain relatively low. And 42% of schools surveyed did not offer any fresh fruit or raw vegetables on a daily basis. Now we do know, so there are things that are being done to combat this. So there actually was a grant that was piloted in Orange County schools where they were actually using fruits and vegetables produced by local farms were then being, so they're being bought by the government and then being used in the Orange County schools to increase exposure to fruits and vegetables as well as stimulate the local economy. So the kids are actually normally are willing to eat it. They just have to actually be offered it and exposed to it. We know of course that when recesses before lunch, children eat better. We need to get recess or physical activity back in, in schools. Um, again, it, it has positive mental aspects, it has positive digestive aspects, right? We, we know that children need to have playtime. So children who require special diet due to medical condition, um, as long as it's reasonable, will receive modified school meals. So if somebody's allergic to something, right, they will provide a substitution, etc. cetera. Um, so again, and that's all part of an IEP. And so if you're not familiar with an individualized education plan, and so again, this has regulations that they need to honor. And so you actually may have to uh, work with a patient. So if they need to have a specific diet at school, you may actually be involved in the development of that child's IEP. So let's just pack lunches at home. Um, and so it sounds great in theory, but lunches packed at home actually usually provide fewer nutrients, but they are lower in fat, right? So uh, part of this is so the choices are limited to those that travel well and require no heating or refrigeration. But the truth of the matter is that ice picks, ice picks, my goodness, ice packs do not really make up for the food safety issues. But when you think of, so for example, uh, a turkey sandwich on white bread, so it's going to be lower in fat, but again, the turkey has no micronutrients, the white bread has no micronutrients. So all you've really done is lower the fat of the, of the meal. Breakfast is often skipped. Children who go to school without breakfast are more likely to experience performance deficits than those who eat breakfast. So what did we do? We created the National School Breakfast Program. So again, we then provide children with breakfast to help improve attendance and performance at school. Now looking at rates of overweight and obesity, so 16.9% of two to 19 year olds have a BMI over the 95th percentile and 31% have a BMI over the 85th. Now when you break this down and stratify this a little bit more by school by childhood age children versus closer to right those adolescents. So 10.4% of children have a BMI over 95th percentile and 21.1% have a BMI greater than the 85th percentile. So there's an increase in prevalence of overweight children and this is a combination of factors but uh, so readily available access to eating and food establishments. So again as we talked about when you look at for example Kaiser University and we have easily 10 restaurants within walking distance of the university. I don't know if you've ever driven down Griffin, but you have that apartment complex there, where again, you have families. So you can see that food is now readily, more readily available than it ever was before. Eating is often tied to sedentary leisure activities. Um, so just in life, right, when you think about um, when you have soccer, we have to bring a snack. When it's a kid's birthday, we bring food to school. Uh, after dance class, we have to get a snack, right? Like it's, it seems like as soon as the activity stops, food's always involved. Um, and this is, if we're watching TV, we have food. If we have friends over, we have mom serves food. Um, and it's not, it's not a bad thing, right? But it's, it's the choices we're offering while we do that. Children are making more food choices and contributing to eating decisions. Again, just look at what's at, so look at what's at your waist height, which is, AKA children's eye level next time you go to the grocery store and you'll see every popular food you can imagine. Portion sizes now are unbelievably large. We have decreased physical activity with a lack of recess 
and play and physical activity in schools. So a lower prevalence in obesity among children that regularly engage in eating the evening meal with their family. So again, a home cooked dinner. Children that get adequate amounts of sleep and children that have limited screen time. So many overweight children have one or more cardiovascular risk factors though, such as hyperlipidemia, hypertension, or hyperinsulinemia. Again, families are essential for modeling food choices, healthy eating, and leisure activities for their children. And so healthcare providers should support and encourage positive parenting. Underweight and failure to thrive can be caused by acute or chronic illness, restricted diet, poor appetite, feeding problems, neglect, or lack or access, lack of access to food. And so an interdisciplinary team is beneficial looking at the social, emotional, and physical findings in addition to nutritional. So it's real simple. Why isn't this kid growing? Oh, he needs to eat more. Well, of course, but why are they not eating, right? Again, is it family issues? Is it access to food, right? So there's, there's more to those types of questions. So iron deficiency. So poor cognitive performance and delayed psychomotor development in patients with iron deficiency and excessive milk consumption may increase the risk. Again, we know this is a poor quality source of iron. Other nutritional issues with children is dental caries from poor dental hygiene. Food allergies, ADHD, and autism can all increase the risk that the, that the patient develops nutrition deficiencies or has poor growth or can lead to failure to thrive. So for preventing chronic disease, we want to encourage sufficient physical activity to maintain healthy weight, increase the intake of fruits, vegetables, fish, and whole grains, low-fat dairy products, adequate calcium intake, and encouraging high fiber intake. Now, of course, the high fiber intake goes along with the whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. So here you can see, so the children still have, there is a, there is a smaller plate for them now, but there is still the pyramid. And so what I just wanted to mention with the pyramid is that we do have the physical activity, which again is a more important thing to manage with a complete. So of course there's food at school, right? So with the school lunch program, the school breakfast program that has regulations, but there's almost no physical activity. And so you can see we want children to have physical activity every single day, which means either before or after school, we need some kind of physical activity for them. All right, so we'll take a look at some practice questions. So the mineral that's important to protect children's teeth against dental caries is, this is going to be answer choice C, fluoride. So when feeding young children, parents can control, and this is answer choice B, the types of foods offered, and appropriate behavior. So again, you can't make children eat, but you can choose what you offer them. Question three, it is important for school-aged children to eat breakfast because, and so this is going to be answer choice A, they are more likely to perform well in school. Number four, one of the most significant public health concerns in children in the United States. And so again, we looked at the statistics for this, and this is going to be answer choice D, being overweight or obese. And I did forget to mention this during the lecture. I do apologize. So the recommendation for fiber intake for children, and this is answer choice D, this is 14 grams per 1,000 calories. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions during Zoom. And again, we will be reviewing the math for catch-up growth and additional calories during the Zoom session. Thank you.